So it's a beautiful day. You can't tell from being inside, but I drove across the bay. It was a glorious day. Uh, and I hope that it will be enlightening as well, as bright as the sun. So here, I have to avoid uh, echoes. I have a slightly different way of presenting this, this session. I usually am criticized for being a bit too technical. Even, even when I speak to medical students, they think I get too complicated, I get carried away in the biochemistry or details that a lot of people won't understand. So I decided to formulate this presentation as just the important things that you need to know about this illness. And um, we'll see how well it goes. I've never done it at this, in this way. It doesn't mean that it doesn't cover important material and it has no depth. It just means that I try to use simpler language, a simpler way of thinking about it. So first thing is we always ask, well, what is Parkinson's disease? There's one way that you can understand it, and there's a way that academics understand it. And to summarize, we really don't know what it is. We think it's probably multiple conditions that result in a clinical syndrome, you know, signs and symptoms that you all are familiar with. But the way the scientists define it, well, it's in a progressive disorder. That means it gets worse with time, with no known cause that results in loss or degeneration of certain brain cells that make a chemical called dopamine. And that is the essence of the definition of Parkinson's disease. So there's a definition that is based on what we see, what patients complain of, what the signs and symptoms of. That one everyone agrees upon. But what is the underlying pathology and what causes it is controversial still. A question that patients always ask me, how do I know that I really have Parkinson's disease? That's a great question. Um, the truth is, we really don't ever know until we examine the brain after someone has died. And that's the bottom line. That's a, neuropathologists are known to be the physicians that know everything, but too late. You know, the internist, well, I'm not going get, to get off on a tangent. But anyway, so pathologists always have the answer. And they, they claim to know what Parkinson's disease is. But in living patients, that I work with and I, I see, uh, it's often hard to confirm that it's Parkinson's disease. So we have a few guidelines. So how I know I can convince my patients they do have the illnesses by the characteristic signs and symptoms that they present with. Um, and what they are, uh, and it's very important that I mention, it begins very, very gradually. Parkinson's disease does not appear overnight. Although, in some situations, it might appear to be that way. It begins usually on one side of the body. In fact, it has to begin on one side of the body. If someone tells me their symptoms began on both sides at the same time, I began to tremor all over, I doubt that's Parkinson's disease. Eventually, though, the illness involves both sides. So it's a bilateral uh, illness, but one side is always the leading side and it doesn't matter if one is right-handed or left-handed, it's a 50% chance whether it'll begin on the right or the left. And one of the important characteristics of, well, I say defining whether or not someone has Parkinson's disease as opposed to Parkinsonism, and I'll get into Parkinsonism in a moment, is whether or not they get better when I give them a simple treatment, which is dopamine replacement. Many of you know it's dopamine replacement by levodopa, carbidopa, which is how I replace dopamine, by giving the pre precursor of dopamine. Since the illness, as I described it at the very def the definition of it, requires there be a loss of dopamine production because there's a death of dopamine-making neurons, administering dopamine in the form of levodopa should replace dopamine and allow people symptoms to improve. So that's the, the main, I think, defining characteristic of whether someone has Parkinson's disease or not. They have characteristic signs and symptoms that we're going to get into. And they get better when we give them levodopa. Now, there are different ways to do dopamine replacement. One is Cinemat. 
which is a combination of levodopa and carbidopa. The other is Stilevo, which is a combination of levodopa, carbidopa, and Comtan. And I'll explain what the Comtan does, if many of you may not know what it does. And then the other approach is to give synthetic dopamine. It's a, it's a, a, a drug that acts directly acts just like dopamine. It fits into the dopamine receptor like a key into a lock and turns on movement. So those are dopamine agonists. And there are two that we use frequently, Premipexol and Ropinirol, or Mirapex and Requip. So what are the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease? Most people consider Parkinson's disease as being a motor disorder. In other words, a mobility problem the ability to use the hands, ability to walk. In fact, we'll, as you'll see, it's much more than that. But the motor symptoms are, are what the illness came to be known by. And in fact, it was in the early days called a paralysis. It was called, and a paralysis means inability to move. Everyone knows that word. The old English word for paralysis was palsy. So when someone had paralysis and they had tremor, that was called the shaking palsy. That's what James Parkinson called it. He didn't call it the illness he described in 1817 Parkinson's disease. He wasn't so you know, self-centered. Um, he just called it the shaking palsy, the shaking weakness. And those are the two major motor characteristics. There is a not true weakness that if uh, individuals with Parkinson's disease have normal strength, but the thing is that they fatigue easier and they're slow in all their movements, so they appear to be weak. But they're not truly weak. So it's not a true paralysis. That's why we don't even use that term anymore. There is a, a slowness of movement, which is known as bradykinesia, which you can, I have it here. I think you can see my arrow moving. Uh, the bradykinesia just means slowness of movement, and akinesia means no movement. People with advanced Parkinson's disease cannot in initiate movement, and they seem to be akinetic. And they might initiate movement if they're suddenly frightened. They can leap out of a wheelchair. Someone yells fire in the, in the building. But um, akinesia and bradykinesia are very characteristic of the illness, especially in the days before any medication was available. People ended up quite immobile, like a log, like a frozen. And many people were considered to be in a frozen state uh, without any blinking, without any expression, without even the tiny little movement to scratch. Um, you know, people are always fidgeting and moving. Well, Parkinson's patients are known for their, this is the days before treatment, for the paucity of movement or a very little spontaneous movement. The other motor characteristic besides this tremor, and I skipped it, but the reason I skipped the tremor and that's what kind of most people associate with the illness, tremor. The fact is, more people have tremor because of essential tremor than because of Parkinson's disease. So if you just pay attention to the tremor, and, and it's funny how people associate the word palsy. If they hear the word palsy, oh, doctor, you mean this? And they shake their hand to show me what they understand to be palsy. And I said, no, the shaking palsy that's the old term for Parkinson's disease. And in fact, 30% of people with Parkinson's disease, one out of every three, never have tremor. But tremor is considered to be one of the defining characteristics. And it's very important to distinguish it from action tremors or the tremors present when one reaches out to do something. Like if I'm reaching out, it starts shaking. But if at rest, it's not there, that's called an action tremor where I put my hand out and then it begins to shake. That's called a postural tremor. But if the tremor is just shaking when I'm doing nothing, uh, is present when I'm doing nothing, that's considered a tremor at rest. And that's the typical tremor of Parkinson's disease. So uh, what makes it a little confusing for some people is that Parkinson's disease can also have a mild postural tremor. So if I'm sitting down, resting my hand on the table and I have a little tremor, if I reach out for the phone, I reach out slowly and there's no tremor. If I hold it for a while, the tremor may begin. But it's very different than the tremor of essential tremor, which may be at rest, but it's worse at, at the reaching and worse as you go to reach the target. That's essential tremor. Tremor doesn't get worse when you use your hands in Parkinson's disease. 
If it does, it means probably you're unfortunate enough to have two illnesses, which are both very common. So I see people with essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. Um, the rigidity is a very important characteristic of illness that the neurologist uses to make the diagnosis. Um, the rigidity is not something that patients complain of. If they complain of being stiff, it's usually because they're a bit arthritic. But the rigidity that we refer to is something that is uh, found on clinical examination. And you know how your doctor takes your arm and moves it back and forth across the joints? Well, we're assessing the extent of resistance to movement. So resistance to a passive movement like that is called rigidity. And there's a very characteristic form of rigidity that only Parkinson's disease has, and that's called cogwheel rigidity, where the movement goes in little steps, almost like a ratchet wrench. Click, 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 click. And, and, and it's uh, very unique, and that's what we're assessing. And it can be picked up at the wrist, at the thumb, at the elbow, at the joint, at the neck. The, the cogwheel rigidity is in most parts of the body eventually. But in the very beginning of the illness, one can pick up the cogwheel rigidity only on one limb, only on, say, at the wrist, and very mildly. Um, so, so there you've heard three of the cardinal signs and symptoms. Resting tremor, slowness of movement, and cogwheel rigidity. Um, then there's a whole host of other things that relate to that, but I should pick up on this postural instability. Postural instability is a fancy name for losing one's balance. It's very easy to lose your balance when you have Parkinson's disease, but it's never a presenting sign. The illness doesn't begin with tendency to lose your balance. It's usually something that develops with time. And so that's the fourth cardinal sign. The first was the rest tremor, slowness of movement, rigidity, and the fourth sign is loss of balance. Now, there are many patients who come to me and they look like they have the whole Parkinson's syndrome. By the way, Parkinson's syndrome just means that you have two of those four cardinal signs. So more, many, many, many more people have Parkinson's syndrome than Parkinson's disease. And I'll explain what the different subtypes are that make up the Parkinson's syndrome. Parkinson's syndrome is, means only two signs or two symptoms. So a person comes in and they have a Parkinson's syndrome and they t I ask them how it began. See, all of this information can only be gathered through a very good history. So a lot of what we do is converse with the patient and find out how things developed over time. If the patient is a good observer, the doctor is brilliant. If you give a really good history, the diagnosis will be clear. It's when the history is muddled or poor and the patient can't remember and the wife is the third wife and she didn't know him when the symptoms began and the children are in Seattle. Those are difficult because I'm just working with the final situation and I don't know what led to what. But if a patient tells me, my problem began with falls, I began to notice that I just couldn't get walking and I fell very easily. And only years later did I begin to notice, you know, a little tremor. Well, that kind of presentation usually is, means it's an atypical Parkinson's syndrome. Usually it means, in those kinds of patients, usually means what we, um, that it's a microvascular, it's, a, it's more of a vascular uh, disorder of the brain, or there's poor blood flow to the brain. Uh, we call it microvascular disease, can present with lower body Parkinsonism, where the problem initially is just the gait and balance. Later on, the upper extremities get involved. That's maybe about 10% of the cases that we see ha are have lower body Parkinsonism or vascular Parkinsonism. And the unfortunate thing about that type of Parkinsonism, it doesn't respond as well to dopamine replacement. So it's really not Parkinson's disease because it, didn't begin insidiously on one side and got to the other. It presented with falls and problems with gait and didn't respond to dopamine replacement to any great degree. So we would say that's not Parkinson's disease, that's lower body Parkinsonism or it's a Parkinson's syndrome. So if you can imagine those cardinal signs and symptoms, there are four of them. I'll go over them again. I do this, the more you say it, the more you understand. Uh, students especially. 
slowness of movement or bradykinesia. And by that, it, I can get usually a good image of that by just having them reach for something. Or I can ask the spouse, how long does it take him or her to get ready to get dressed, to go out? And they say, oh, it takes forever just to get dressed, etc. So that's bradykinesia. And the rigidity, which we pick up, sometimes patients are very aware of their rigidity and the loss of balance eventually. Um, but because of these cardinal signs of, of slowness of movement, or, or very little movement, there's a whole bunch of other features you can notice. So there's less mobility of the face as well. So the face becomes impassive, uh, mask-like. Uh, many people consider it a poker face, lack of expression, uh, hypomimia, all those, all those reflect decreased movement of the face. So much of our emotions are expressed by subtle movements of the face. And it's really interesting, uh, my daughter who uh, has a friend who's an actress was saying for movies, the close-ups are very intense. They just show the face and a really good actor can just raise an eyebrow. And that's all you need to do to convey a certain yeah. But a person with Parkinson's disease, if you zoom in on the face, maybe you'll see a little tremor of the lip. That's about the degree of emotion that you'll see. Uh, or it looks like a sad emotion, because when one is very down and depressed, there's little expression. But the fact is, patients may not feel sad or down at just a decreased facial expression. It's the frequency of blinking is about half the frequency of someone who's of age-matched controls. So you'll see less blinking, so there's kind of a stare, a staring look. Um, so that, that's what we mean by masked face. Hypophonia just means very low voice volume. Again, it's because of the cardinal sign of rigidity. The rigidity involves muscles of the intercostal muscles that are important in moving the chest in and out when you breathe. And the diaphragm, which is this big muscle that separates your abdomen from your thorax, that when it contracts, you bring air in. When you relax, it's air out, just the opposite. Well, that has very limited excursion because of rigidity. So people's airflow through the vocal cords is very diminished. So the voice becomes very low and breathy. And it's almost like a whisper. And eventually, muteness. Sometimes you just cannot, there's just no movement of air. Just imagine the little, the diaphragm excursion, the chest wall excursion very, being only a tiny amount. You can imagine the voice volume is going to be very, very low. Um, and so some of the, what we call ancillary signs, accompanying signs of Parkinson's disease, are really a function of the rigidity and the slowness. I was going to show you some cases. There should be a video here of the classical. Uh, and it's here. Yeah, it's here. Uh, I'm just got to see where it is. Is is it on the um, whoever put this together for us? Is there sound? There there is some sound. Let's see if I see the video. Yeah. I don't know where the video is. No. Well, well. Let me let me just see. Uh, whose computer is this? <laughs> I was looking for the video that that I sent. Well, maybe. Uh, let me just go on to here. I'll just open Video. videos. Okay. Okay. So, the, uh, what I'm going to show you is a videotape from uh, a movement disorder journal called Movement Disorders, and it has videotapes. And we, we rate people's stage of, I don't know the video I sent. Where is it? No. It's just a, a three or four minute clip. And PBK is just here. That should be it. Can't record this. Let's see. Can I? There it goes. Let's open it up a bit. Should be under. Uh, 
you know what, it may not, unless it's quick time, it won't play. Do I have quick time? No, my computer so it should play it. Yeah, okay. So here's what I, I'm just showing you. You just have to look at yourselves and, your, and, and family members to see the cardinal signs and symptoms. But we actually rate them from zero to four. So we rate rest tremor zero to four on the right, the left, the legs. And we have a unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. And this shows the uh, degrees of tremor, degrees of slowness, degrees of rigidity, degrees of, 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 of if we can't get it, it's, it's OK. It, it's just a very quick demonstration. If we right click the video, then you can play it as, and then so right click it. Open with quick time, um, quick time player. Yeah, that should work because it, it's a move dot movie. Right. Uh, you just say yes or no, or whatever. Just they all play with. Oh. Yeah. Oh, somebody, uh, anyway. That should be it. just click play, and we'll make it a little bigger. Okay, so here, here's an example. We don't have sound for it. Oh, okay, all right. Don't need sound. <laughs> so there's tremor, and it's increasing in intensity, and that's very prominent tremor. It's on both sides. Here's tremor of the jaw. Let's see, it's a little worse. Here's tremor of the right lower extremity. That's the kind of things we're looking for. And this is tremor when it's become bilateral. It's, Here's the slowness of movement, just very mild. See, his fingertips are very slow, mildly. Look how much slower hers are. You see, there's not much movement elsewhere in her body. See how slow it is in the amplitude. Gets, she can barely do it. See that? So that's advancing slowness. It, here's the walking, very small steps, no arm swing. Not too bad, turns with several steps, the, and then the walking is almost gone, and then they fall. She can't walk anymore. And they fall easily. That's how we test retropulsion of uh, postural stability. And when they fall over like that, it means they, you can imagine just a slight shift in the center of gravity, and they're to the ground. And invariably, um, people can develop to this stage, which requires them to be in a wheelchair quite a lot. Um, and what we're trying to do in research is delay progression of the disease and hopefully avoid uh, reaching those stages. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you. Uh, just, no, where's the rest? Where's my talk? Okay. Sorry for the delay, the technical glitch here, but uh, so I, I spoke of the importance of the motor symptoms because that's how we can make a diagnosis. We usually don't lose the other non-motor symptoms for the diagnosis. Motor symptoms are easily ascertained. In other words, I can observe them and test them, patients will notice them. But some of these other things take a lot more skill. For example, the cognitive or thinking decline that can occur. Uh, the ability to uh, perform certain cognitive tasks, along with psychiatric issues of depression, anxiety. Um, all of these require a little bit more attention, and Dr. Cimino is a neuropsychologist. He's going to speak about a lot of these issues, the cognitive and psychiatric symptoms. So the important thing to realize is that though we focus so much on the motor disorder and our treatments focus on the motor disorder, the illness is actually a global disorder. The whole brain is really involved in this illness, and that's a whole new idea about the illness. We used to think of it as just a focal problem. Just one subset of brain cells are not doing well. But we know there's a whole network of brain cells that are not doing as well. And it interferes with issues like sleep. That's what the auto, well, you know, the sleep dysfunction is more than what I would say cognitive or psychiatric. It's almost an invariable part of the illness is to have a sleep disturbance. In fact, many patients with Parkinson's disease 
begin to have sleep disorders way before the diagnosis is made. It's a very characteristic type of sleep disorder. It's called REM behavior sleep disorder, where dreaming doesn't occur at the normal phase, and people can have very vivid dreams out of phase. Sometimes it seems so real, and they act out their dreams. They may yell a lot in their sleep or fight imaginary people and thrash and kick about. That's not normal in sleep. That's called dream sleep disorder. Or REM is that part of sleep, REM means rapid eye movement sleep, that occurs every 90 minutes of sleep, and it occurs at a specific part of the cycle. And that becomes disturbed in Parkinson's disease. So many, many people have serious problems with sleep, and everyone assumes it's just because of depression. Well, depression is also, can also produce sleep disorders. And in fact, when I tell you about what we know about the illness that expands beyond the dopamine neurons, you'll understand why there's a problem with sleep and mood. The other problem are this middle column of autonomic nervous system involvement. That's that part of the nervous system that controls all of our visceral functions, like our blood pressure, our heart rate, our automatic breathing, all our automatic stuff, like sweating, hair on standing on end, pupils getting big, etc. And that is also dysfunctional. So people won't complain of, say, constipation, bladder problems, feeling hot or cold, periods of sweating. And it's because one of the neurochemicals involved in control of, the, of one branch of this automatic nervous system is called the sympathetic nerves, and they make noradrenaline. And noradrenaline is a cousin of dopamine. And it seems like neurons that make these kinds of catecholamines, those are the, the, that's a chemical, here I'm getting technical. But anyway, I'm sorry if I get technical, but nervous system outside of the brain that's involved in autonomic control also degenerates, also has a, a, this pathology, and it gets worse with time. Eventually, Everyone with Parkinson's disease has an autonomic nervous system sign or, or symptom. Invariably, it's constipation <laughs> or bladder problems or lightheadedness when they stand. And that's all part of the Parkinson's disease picture. The other part is this sensory kind of uh, thing where you feel weird things, tingling, numbness, sometimes aching deep in the muscles. And in fact, that can be one of the presenting signs. People will notice that there's an aching in the shoulder. They see their doctor, thinks it's a frozen shoulder syndrome. They do MRIs. They consider doing surgery. But then they happen to notice soon after they have a little tremor. And that leads to a neurologist who diagnoses Parkinson's disease. The rigidity and the aching gets better with lipidopa. Um, but when James Parkinson described the shaking palsy, he said there's no sensory involvement. He said a lot of things that were incorrect because he'd only seen seven cases. Do you know that it, you can get famous for seeing just seven cases and writing about it? That's James Parkinson. It was because of this great neurologist Charcot in the late 19th century, who's kind of one of the fathers of modern neurology, who tried to relate brain structure to neurological symptoms. And he, he was very impressed uh, by James Parkinson's work and decided not to call the illness paralysis agitant, but said we should honor Mr. Parkinson by naming this d disease, giving it his name. Um, that often happens. So people ask me, how common is this illness anyway? I mean, I, I think by now you understand what it is, roughly how we diagnose it, but you probably aren't too familiar with how common it is. Well, it's the second most common neurodegenerative disorder. Neurodegenerative means that populations of brain cells don't function well. They degenerate, and sometimes they actually disappear. They die. Sometimes they're just misfunctioning. Alzheimer's disease is the number one. Soon, close after, is Parkinson's disease, and they're both age-dependent illnesses. They tend to occur after the age of 50. Um, and since we have an aging population, uh, we're seeing more and more of it. And there's a lot more of it down the road unless 
researchers find a way to delay it um, or prevent it completely. And you'll see why that's a big challenge because there, it's more than one cause here. But, it, but if we could figure out the most common cause, we may be able to make some progress. So about 0.5 to 1% of people between 65 and 69 um, have the illness. I like to say about one in 100. The, the, like, uh, one of the w uh, ways to express it is the lifetime risk or the probability of anyone in this country developing Parkinson's disease by the age of 70 is one in 100. But the chances are good, 99 in 100, that you won't develop Parkinson's disease. So it's not so bleak and glum for you know, the, you know, the healthcare profession. Now, the cause of Parkinson's disease is unknown. So the term by, you may have heard is idiopathic Parkinson's disease, or IPD. That just means that it's a Parkinson's disease is unknown with regard, I mean, the cause of it is unknown. And when I was a medical student, the way we were, we always had funny ways to remember things. I, some of them were kind of shady. Uh, you don't want to talk about them in public. But this one is OK. Idiopathic meant the doctor was an idiot, and the patient was pathetic. OK. So, so that means we don't know the cause, right? And that way, you won't ever forget the word idiopathic. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's always a, you know, the, the US is very, and we all are, into the state of the economy. And the cost of Parkinson's disease in the United States is estimated to exceed $6 billion. I don't know how one calculates that, but, but that's the number that's in the literature. So if we cure the disease, maybe we'll save all that money. That's a way to decrease the deficit. But the cost of curing it is going to be probably $20 billion. Right? So we'll be in the red no matter what we do. But people will be happier. Okay. So the, what neurologists do, and why I'm a neurologist, is because the brain is a fascinating organ. It's the most, from my view, the most important organ. Although the cardiologists say the heart is the most important organ. In fact, the heart and the brain work very well together. Um, in fact, the blood vessels in the nerves all develop in parallel. Wherever you see a major artery, you'll see a major nerve running along. And even in the area where brains form, the small vasculature is critical. And if you decrease blood flow to the brain, you're going to have decreased brain function. And if you increase blood flow to the brain, you improve brain function. That's why aerobic exercise enhances the birth of new neurons. So, so yeah, I think the brain is the most important, but it can't exist in isolation. Um, and, but the part of the brain that is involved in this illness is the part, predominantly, is the part that makes dopamine. Uh, and that's the black substance, substantia nigra. That's where neurons or brain cells that make dopamine reside. And they project their fibers. You know, brain cells are communication cells. So there's a whole bunch of, there's a node of the cell bodies, and they send out wires everywhere, and they receive wires from other cells. The dopamine neurons send out a whole host of wires or, or axons, and they branch out like an oak tree, fine twigs, and release dopamine at their targets, called the, uh, the, the corpus striatum. Um, and the important thing to remember, anything that destroys this set of neurons, this important branching, will cause Parkinsonism. And from experimental data supports that. But interruption of nigrostriatal dopamine action, it will lead to slowness, rigidity, and Parkinsonism. And we've come to realize that that network is part of a larger network of so-called basal ganglia that's responsible for the automatic movements that we don't even think about. So just reaching and, and walking and just the automatic execution of these learned motor programs depends on these intact neural networks. And one of the things, the last point that I, I, I don't want to forget, 
Yes, the Nigro Stride dopamine system is the one we know the most about, but other systems, you know, you can imagine in a network, interconnected network, if you lose one important component, what happens downstream? What happens to other neuronal systems? Well, they don't function as well either. So that's why we end up having a lot of other symptoms besides just slowness and rigidity. So here's just a picture of where the midbrain is. It's really deep in the brain. And so here's an imaginary cut through right above the ear, right through the eye, and you'll see the cerebral cortex. And here's the midbrain. You can see why it's called midbrain. It's right in the middle. And there's the black substance. Right? And in this black substance are all those brain cells that make dopamine. And it's black because it is a pigment called neuromelanin that is a byproduct of levodopa metabolism. Levodopa, if you ever take your cinnamon and put it in water, you'll see it turns brown, just like peeling a banana and leaving it to the air. It oxidizes. But when levodopa oxidizes, it forms a polymer, a brown pigment. And that's exactly why we have an accumulation of neuromelanin in those brain cells. When you're born, you don't have neuromelanin. You're pale. It's like a, a clean soul, so to speak. And with time and aging, we develop these little black pigments, all of our sins, so to speak. <laughs> you can tell I was raised a Catholic. But, uh, but the fact is, you know, metaphors sometimes are helpful. The fact is, if you develop the illness, the cells that make dopamine die, and there's no place for the neuromelanin to exist, and neuromelanin is cleared away. So you end up with a very pale substantia nigra, depigmented. And that's how the brain of a Parkinson's patient looks. They've lost this pigmented area. Um, and if you look at a real midbrain, you can see this is the one that's healthy, and this is what a Parkinson's midbrain looks like. And if you magnify this, 400 times under a microscope and look at certain um, remaining neurons, you'll see they have pink bodies. Those are called Lewy bodies. Those are abnormal cellular inclusions that accumulate in those neurons in Parkinson's disease. And you can stain them in different ways using what's called immunohistochemistry. You can see there's a brown pigment, though it's not really brown. It's just for our, so we can see it under the microscope. The interesting thing is that those Lewy bodies that the pathologists say equals idiopathic Parkinson's disease, they'll say, remember I said the pathologists know everything, but it's too late you know, to do anything about it? Well, when they see Lewy bodies in the midbrain, they say that this case was idiopathic Parkinson's disease. That's how the definition is. So idiopathic Parkinson's disease means a patient who has Lewy bodies and who also had in life slowness, rigidity, and tremor. That's the definition of idiopathic Parkinson's. We don't know why this happened or how it happened. But the important thing is that these Lewy bodies actually don't begin to be deposited in the midbrain. They're deposited at the two ends of the brain. The, the olfactory bulbs, which is here. This is the brain lying on its back. You see it on the underside. This is from the side. The olfactory bulb receives all this information from the outer world of sense of smell. And the Medulla, way down here, receives all this information, especially the vagus, from the gut and the viscera. So you can imagine why, and that's where you see the Lewy bodies first, produce no symptoms. Maybe loss of sense of smell. That may be the first symptom, which we see in, in Parkinson's. You also see that in Alzheimer's. But it kind of makes you think that the illness is due to an environmental toxicant, right? Because if the first Lewy bodies appear right at the olfactory bulb or in the medulla, in the vagus nerve center, the vagus gets all this innervation from the gut. Imagine you ate something, some metal, some kind of toxicant. Well, it'll be transported back into the brain through those long fibers. So this is one of the speculations of why we have Lewy bodies there in the beginning. And then they gradually spread. As they gradually spread, by the time they hit the midbrain, that's when the first symptoms begin. So how do we treat the illness? We have very little time left, which is good because I think I've covered most of the things I wanted to say, what you need to know. How many minutes? Five minutes. Perfect. Take three. OK, so how do we treat it? And you're going to hear a lot about this. Uh, Dr. Hauser will be speaking about clinical trials, about new treatments. But the symptomatic treatment just is our medicines that we administer 
to alleviate signs and symptoms. The medicines that we give to alleviate slowness, rigidity, tremor, they really do nothing to stop that Lewy body spread, to stop the degeneration. But they alleviate the symptoms, OK? Uh, and so the first drugs that were used in the 19th century were anticholinergic drugs. We still use them, um, Artane, Cogentin. And I'm not going to get into the side effects so much, other they do cause dry mouth. And they worsen some of the constipation because they block uh, some of the normal, well, the neurochemicals involved in um, neurotransmitters involved in gut movement. Um, we use dopamine replacement. In fact, it's also therapeutic and, di and diagnostic. Some people say that levodopa is a theragnostic agent. I never heard that term. Some, you know, it's a merging of therapeutic and diagnostic. And amantadine, those are drugs that we use to alleviate symptoms. Um, neuroprotective therapies are, we've been trying to find something to protect the cells from degenerating. And the biggest study that was done in the early, in the, from 85 to 89 was called Datatop, where we looked at Delpranil and Tocopherol, which is vitamin E. And unfortunately, we couldn't see that vitamin E slowed progression. But there were flaws to that study. And now there are studies going on with really huge doses of either vitamin E, not so much, or coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10, which is down here as a mitochondrial enhancer, uh, is believed to slow progression, but the studies are ongoing. The vitamin E turned out to be a failure, and you can't give huge doses beyond 2,000 units a day. Um, Anti-apoptotic agents have been looked at, and they're not very uh, promising at this point. So there's very little in terms of neuroprotective therapies that we have. Uh, people are looking at uh, uh, well, I'm, I, later on when we talk about clinical trials, we'll, we'll speak some more about potential neuroprotective therapies. The one that I, I just wanted to mention is rosagiline, Azelect, because that is the only one now that definitely has evidence of neuroprotection. And people on Azelect have a slower, at least in some of the studies I think Dr. Hauser will speak about, um, show that it does slow progression. Uh, and Azelect, or rosagiline, is very similar to selegiline or Depranil. And many people still are on Depranil because it probably does have a beneficial effect in slowing progression. So I, the way I'd say it right now, the vitamin E is just good for general health at 2,000 units. Coenzyme Q10 may be slowing progression as uh, rosagiline. And this will be, I think, the final slide. You always hear about, oh, I shouldn't get on levodopa because I can only use it for so much time. Here's the general rule for when to start medication. Um, in the very early stages of the illness, when there's just very mild symptoms and no disability from the symptoms, people can still work and take care of themselves, uh, we would delay levodopa. We wouldn't use it right away. I might use a dopamine agonist first if the signs and symptoms are starting to interfere, like say with handwriting, and a person may not be able to fill out forms at his job or use the keyboard. And I might introduce a dopamine agonist or an MAOB inhibitor, and that's rosagiline or selegiline, which is neuroprotective. So, or I might add coenzyme Q10 at this point. So in the very early stages, you don't need to use levodopa. Um, if, the, if symptoms are bothersome, you might use an agonist, like Requip or Primapexol, and certainly Azelect or an MAOB inhibitor. As the illness gets more advanced, the symptoms are interfering with everyday activities, we will introduce carbidopa levodopa at that point. On top of dopamine agonist, it depends on the age. If they're less than 60, I would probably use an agonist before carbidopa levodopa because carbidopa levodopa can increase the likelihood of involuntary movements known as dyskinesias, which is one of the problems that plagues people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, and when there's more advancing disease with motor fluctuations, we'll add content to the carbidopa levodopa and maybe the combination drugs. And throughout all of this, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy should be uh, a component of the treatment of the whole person. I'm not going to get into how levodopa works. 
but does levodopa lose its benefits? I want to point this out. It never really loses its benefits at all. What happens is the therapeutic window begins to close, and this, this is what I mean by a therapeutic window. In the early disease, you just take one tablet of levodopa carbidopa. The blood levels of levodopa rise, reach a peak, and they gradually wear off. And when it gets below a certain level in the blood, the patient is off. They don't move well. They may have more tremor. And so during this whole period of on time, this is called the therapeutic window, where a pretty broad range of blood levodopa results in being on. With time, the therapeutic window narrows. The on period becomes shorter. And eventually, when, you, when the threshold for dyskinesias is down, the threshold for being on is up. The on period is very short. There's a, a lot of period of dyskinesia, and then long off periods. And this is what happens during the natural horse. People will still respond to levodopa, but in advanced disease, you might have these motor fluctuations, being on, a lot of dyskinesias, being off. And what is important for a physician who treats it is to work with the schedules. And this is the problem. There are complications for medications, the motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. Uh, so when people have really severe motor fluctuations and they're healthy otherwise and have intact cognitive function, they're candidates for deep brain stimulation. And that involves putting an electrode that reaches the subthalamic nucleus right over the substantia nigra. And by stimulating that region, by the way, why choose that? That's an area that becomes overactive when you lose dopamine. Um, as you lose dopamine, the, uh, the subthalamic nucleus becomes overactive. And by stimulating it at high frequency, you shut down the discharge of those neurons. And that seems to be effective in controlling that therapeutic window. So you no longer have as much dyskinesia. So you, don't, you're, you get, you're have more on time with lesser amount of levodopa. And that's the benefit. And who should consider DBS? Well, when the motor complications of dyskinesias aren't responding, to optimal treatment. Uh, and it's really very troublesome. Usually they're younger people that have the worst motor fluctuations. And in order to be considered for deep brain stimulation, you have to be examined completely off of all medicine and given a challenge dose of levodopa. If you don't re improve with the challenge dose, you're not a candidate, which means you don't really have Parkinson's disease. That's why they do that. And you can't have any problem with cognitive function. In other words, you can't be demented or have serious depression, because the deep brain stimulation were worse than that, and no other significant medical problems. Thank you for your attention. And we'll continue this uh, later.